I'm Ms. Sloan, and this is AP Biology, and this is our review for the Unit 6 exam. Say hi. hi. They're sounding weak and pathetic. Okay, now, everybody in who wants to be in? Okay, here we go. Now, first of all, I probably spent putting this review last night from about 8.30 to 10.30, okay? So I tried to combine everything I possibly could. I want to remind you there were two quizzes that we had. I mean, sorry, two chapters we had, chapter 20 and chapter 42, that we never even had a quiz over, right? So I made those reviews are embedded in here too. And so I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that, okay? So I know it feels like a lot. Does it feel like a lot? Okay. And so we're just do the best we can. We're going to work our way through it. I am quite confident you can be successful if you've been reviewing as we've gone along. Yes? Of course. All right. So this whole one is gene expression and regulation. And as we work our way through, I'm so afraid something's going to go wrong. There we go. So these are the eight topics from the college board that I put on just one page. I took out all the individual objectives. And so for each of those topics, I told you where the chapter was. So you could go back and review those chapters. If you said, wait, I don't know anything about that, then you can go look at the college board and look at that section and kind of review it that way. Um, another thing that I did is there are, and hopefully they all still work, here are three cahoots that you can just do on your own. You just kind of log in if you want to review these three topics right here. And you will have access to this because I send you this Pear Deck plus I post it, right? So you'll have access to it. So that's there as well. So when we look at um, starting with chapter 12, when we look at that, the big ticket items was the history of our understanding of DNA, the structure of DNA, that structure should be a review because we already learned that. I think that was unit, was that unit one or unit two? I can't remember the four important organic molecules. One, so you already learned that. The new part on there was replication and then kind of looking at the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And that's a trend through this whole unit is just looking to see because the DNA is arranged differently because prokaryotes, the DNA is what? circular and in eukaryotes it's linear and it's diploid so that just affects all parts of control replication and transcription right as well as translation when we talk about that because prokaryotes don't have a what nucleus all right so then working through that hopefully you remember those i tried to compile all the experiments and just put them on one page and that was with our understanding of um, DNA as our hereditary material. Because you can remember early on, the confusion would be, is it DNA or is it protein? Because how many different amino acids do we have to choose from in a protein? And DNA, we only have four. So intuitively, you might think, you know, proteins are our genetic language, but it is DNA. So the experiments that helped us show that, do you remember the mice and the and what experimenter was that? Griffin. And remember the S strain and the R strain. And this also gave us a model of transformation, right? And that's one way we talked about later how bacteria can get new, and you know, the most common way is through mutation, but another way they can get traits is through transformation where they pick up DNA extracellularly, right, from their environment. And in this case, the noble R strain became the lethal S strain when it got some dead S DNA incorporated into its own strain and then it was killing off mice. Then you have Avery McLeod and McCarty who further showed that when you digested the protein, the mouse still died, but when you digested the nucleic acid, um, then the mouse will live because the code was the nucleic acid. That was the part that was the transforming agent. Then we went on to look at the structure of DNA and we talked about Chargaff. Remember Chargaff said, hey, each species has a specific amount of A, T's, G's, and C's, but however many A's they have, they'll have the same amount of T's, right? Then Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, they were shining x-rays, right? And through the DNA and from that, we know it's double-stranded repeating units and same diameter, right? 
And then Watson and Crick used all of that. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. Hershey and Chase. That was with bacteriophage. And remember, they were trying to figure out when a virus infects a cell, is it overtaking it with its protein or overtaking it with its nucleic acid? And so they labeled its nucleic acid with that isotope P32, because nucleic acids are base sugar phosphate. And they labeled the protein, they labeled it with S35, and that was the sulfur. And that's because cysteine has sulfur in it, and that's a common amino acid. So what they found out is it was overtaking it, that bacteriophage, with the nucleic acid. All right, so those are some of the historical experiments. And then Watson and Crick put it all together, okay, to this double helix. And we know when we look at the anatomy of it, if I took DNA as a ladder and I made it all flat, right? And if I, if I was crawling up the rungs of the ladder, what would I be grabbing? Well, mostly bases, right? And then in between those bases would be what? Hydrogen bonds, right? Hydrogen bonds in between the bases. But if I was the base, if I was the nitrogenous base adenine, what are all the things I would be connected to if I was adenine? Thymine via how many? And then I'd also be connected to? To a what? Sugar. And what number carbon on that sugar? One, right? Remember our numbering? I'm combining several things for you here. Okay, now I'm the sugar. What am I connected to? Phosphate. Phosphate's on either side of me and nitrogenous base. Now I'm phosphate. What am I connected to? Just sugars. And all of those, If wait, if I'm phosphate, am I connected to any nitrogenous bases? No, because no. it's an alternating phosphate sugar backbone, right? And coming off the sugars and the sugars only, coming off the sugars and the sugars only are the nitrogenous bases. Now, parallel means going the same way. Like, so if you go down the 405 south, all the lanes going south on the 405, those are parallel, right? But if you look at a southbound lane against a northbound lane, that would be not parallel, that would be anti-parallel. And that's the way the DNA runs. So if my fingertips are three prime, my elbow is five prime. And then the complementary strand with my elbow here would be five and my three. And when this becomes important is when we talk about DNA replication, because the enzyme that facilitates that DNA polymerase three reads from reads three to five fingertip to elbow and makes five to three, right? And so it has a leading strand and then right across from it would be the right. lagging strand and it makes it in discontinuous fragments called Okazaki. Okazaki fragments, which we had to put primer down there, right? Using primase, about 10 base pairs of RNA to get our party started every single time. Primer one time on our leading strand, multiple times on our lagging strand, right? Those discontinuous ones. What do we use to get rid of that primer? DNA polymerase one, he's the one to save us. And then we're gonna seal all those fragments together with ligase. And those are gonna twist up and be what? Sister chromatids held together by a, that are gonna separate during, see? See how smart you are? It's not as hard as what you think. Do you think it would be important to know all the enzymes that I took the time to teach you in that process? Like where you could list them out beginning to end? I think so too. I think so too. Like I wouldn't be confused about any of their jobs. I would like know for sure I'd have that cold. Okay. And what was the first one? When I do this, unwind, unzip, that was helicase, which means I need a little because it starts to back tangle. What else do I need? Yes, that's exactly right. That would be something to know. All right. Are we good on this? Yes. Is it called RNA primus? Did I say the words DNA primus? Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything more on that one? Okay. So I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Right? So you can review this. Okay. Did you see how the steps were there for a second? So you will have all those steps already written for you. I did nothing. I did nothing. It just started seizing on its own. 
Just look away so you don't have a seizure. If Just listen to my voice. Just listen to my voice. Don't look at the screen. Last time it just stopped when I did that. It just, Pear Deck, I need some words with you, Pear Deck. Let me try adding a new prompt. Drawing. Okay, I'm going to keep going, and hopefully this is going to stop seizing. So just pay attention to me. I'll make myself bigger so you don't have a heart attack. Because I want to have a heart attack right now. Oh, did it stop? Oh, it's frozen up there? I wonder if it's still recording. It's still recording. Bummer. Spent, like I said, two hours trying to make this for you. Yes, baby. Sweetheart, you're going to have to wait on your individual questions till I get through this. Okay? All right. Guys, I'm going to keep talking irregardless of what's going on. When it settles down, let me know and I'll stop being the big person. All right? Okay. So then after we talked about DNA structure and replication, then we went on to talk about transcription and mm -hmm. translation. So the process of transcription, remember, we're not copying everything like we do with DNA replication. We're just copying what we need, right? That, that's the first thing. Don't think of it like DNA replication where everything gets copied, okay? So... What we know is we're going to make an RNA copy called what? mRNA. What does the M stand for? Messenger RNA. And we're going to make an mRNA copy of that that is complementary to the DNA. So if the DNA says G, then the RNA nucleotide brought in is going to say what? C. Good. And then so forth. If it says C, it's going to be G. If it's T, it's going to be A. But if it's A, it's going to be U. And the sugar is different because it's ribose, not deoxyribose. And RNA is generally single-stranded. Perfect. So in order to do that, instead of using DNA polymerase, we're going to use what? RNA polymerase. And RNA polymerase has to bind to a what? Promoter. And then we know background on that, right? Helps and hurts on all of that. But let's just get the basics down. RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. It boom, boom, boom and we make our mRNA. Now, if this is a prokaryotic cell, is this mRNA good to go? Yes, it is. Because prokaryotic cells don't have any what? Intron. In fact, you could be mid-transcription with some of the RNA dangling off and RNA polymerase still working to transcribe and you can have ribosomes connect with that mRNA and immediately start translating it simultaneously as transcription is still going on. That's what happens in a prokaryotic cell. But in a eukaryotic cell, we have a lot of DNA. And how much of it do we actually express as a protein? Well, remember we revisited the central dogma and we're saying, hey, maybe we're still expressing stuff, but we're expressing it as what? RNA. And it's going to be regulatory. Does that make sense? Did it stop seizing? Yeah. Oh, good Lord. Okay. I'm not going to change the paint right here, okay? But you saw there are differences between DNA and RNA there, yes? Okay. And we already went over that. So we're right here. We're at that processing part. So when that, yes? <coughs> yes. Right? Usually negative. Remember that? The negative? Remember repressors? Yeah. I'm just painting the big picture right now. Okay? So, and I'm spending more time on this chapter because this is our oldest chapter of the unit, right? Some of these other ones we reviewed. If I don't get to everything, do you have access to my individual reviews? Yes. But I want to hit the two we didn't review for sure. This one and the two we didn't review. But this presentation has all of them on there. Okay, has all of them on there. I'll try going back one page. I don't remember switching it. Okay. All right, we got, okay, it doesn't match what I have. Okay, I'm just so nervous about it. Okay, so when we make our RNA, 
we have to put on a cap of 7-methylguanosine. We have to put on a, what is that tail? 100 to 200 adenines. Good. And it's not just adenines all by themselves. It's like repeating nucleotides of adenine. Okay. And then we have to cut out the, and we're going to leave the, and I could have DNA and, you know, I could even cut out some exons for one protein. I could just still cut those out and then get a totally different protein, right? And that's why we say our genome is smaller than our proteome. Proteome is studying, right, proteins, functionality, what they do. Genome is studying the DNA, right? Okay. So then um, it has to leave the nucleus. And when it leaves the nucleus at that point, then it's going to want to hook up with a ribosome. First, a small ribosomal subunit, and then the large ribosomal subunit. Good. And I'm going to go back. I don't know what it did here. Okay, we did that. Try to get it. There we go. Stop. Okay. So here's our mRNA. Every three bases on our mRNA is called a codon. That codon is complementary to a? Does every anticodon bring an amino acid? No, who doesn't? Stop codons, right? Stop codons are not going to bring you an amino acid. And when we translate our mRNA, remember we read three to five, making five to three. We read the mRNA like the plus strand in a virus would be five to three because that's good to go on a ribosome, okay? And then we're not going to start until we have our initiation codon, which is not labeled here, but it's AUG, okay, AUG. And the first amino acid is methionine. Now we know what post-translational control is, right? What is that? After we've built the, yeah, post-translational. So we've already done translation. In the folding of that protein, we might cut some segments out of that protein. So it doesn't mean that every protein out there ends up with a methionine as its first amino acid because it could be processed. Just want to bring that to your attention. Okay. This um, exon recombination from the same gene can give us multiple different proteins. We discussed that. The steps a protein synthesis, remember the three binding sites on the ribosome, the very first tRNA lands in the, in the what site? P. Yeah, the P site. Then tRNA2 lands in the A site. And then the ribosome shifts. And when it does that, it shifts the amino acid that was on the tRNA, the first one in the P site, onto the a site, and then it shifts that tRNA that was in the A site into the P site, and the one that's in the P site is now going to what? Exit. And that's going to keep going until you reach a stop codon. Okay? These are all still links that you could follow for videos. Okay? So if you open this up or your class one, there's two videos here. There's a video right there where you could watch that in action. Okay? And then... I'm just reminding you here, look at prokaryote. Here's transcription, and it's immediately getting translated. Whereas in eukaryotes, we have our processing, then we leave and we get translated out in the cytoplasm. Are you all right there? Okay. Then the next thing was chapter 13. So differentiate and provide authentic examples between inducible and repressible. Are you thinking of which ones are inducible and repressible right now? What are you thinking about for inducible? I'm thinking lactose, the lac operon, because the presence of that reactant, that lactose, binds with an active repressor and removes it. Remember that? So that you end up making the enzymes to digest the lactose. Versus a repressible operon, that operon's on, but we could repress it. What are we going to repress it with? Yeah, our product. What's our product? Tryptophan. I mean, technically, we're making the enzymes to build the tryptophan, but once we've built the tryptophan, that acts as a what repressor? What do we call that? Co-repressor. Co and then that co-repressor shuts that operon down. Okay? P 
positive versus negative controls. What are we talking about there? Positive controls are using transcription factors. Generally, you see that in what kind of cells? Eukaryotic cells, okay? And it's not just transcription factors that help RNA polymerase bind to the... Remember the complexity of what we saw there? There were activators that bind to the enhancer, which then bind to the transcription factors. And all of that cell signaling needs to take place before you turn that gene on, right? Whereas negative control is all about what? Repressors. Whether or not the repressor is active or not active at birth, we don't care. The very fact that you're controlling an operon with a repressor or any DNA with a repressor is considered negative control. Then when we go to prokaryotic versus eukaryotic, prokaryotic, remember, they're all organized in operons where you have like one operator who controls that whole metabolic sequence and it's a single circular chromosome. So it's just, you need to dock into that one place and it's like one shop, it's the target. It's just like, you can pretty much find everything there that you need to get. It's all in sequence in the DNA. Whereas eukaryotic chromosomes, you're going to five different shops to get everything, even though you ultimately have the same goal, right? And that's how we can, as long as you have the same things there, the same positive, because you use positive control, primarily for eukaryotic cells, as long as all of those components are there, you can turn it on in every single chromosome that you need it, right? So prokaryotic versus eukaryotic, eukaryotic don't have the operon, all right? Then name and describe and differentiate between the five levels of control. And I have a slide for that, but remember we talked about chromatin. Then what do we talk? And we have examples for that. What else? Transcriptional control? Post-transcriptional, translational, post-translational, and examples for each one of those. And then mutations are the primary source of variation. When could it be neutral or beneficial or bad? And differentiate between point and frame shift mutations. So, right, I don't know what the next, oh. Here I differentiated between the two strategies, right, about an operon being on or off. You have that already. We've discussed that. Then I gave you the tryptophan, right? And this would be a what an example of what kind of? Well, yeah, we got a repressor, so it's negative control, but what kind? Repressible, right? Repressible. And then, no. Okay, so we'll just listen to me again. I don't know why it's seizing. Did it stop? No. It's too much to ask for. Okay, focus on me, focus on me. Okay, so then when we talked about, we did repressible, the lack operon would be inducible, right? Levels of control. When I think about chromatin structure, I'm thinking about what kind of thing? methyl groups, acetyl groups. I'm thinking about um, bar bodies, right? Heterochromatin, euchromatin, remember all of that? When I think about transcriptional control, I'm thinking about positive and negative controls. I'm thinking about inducible and repressible operons, all of that. And then when I think about post-transcriptional control, what am I thinking about? Cap, tail, exon recombination. Translational control, I could be thinking about how I'm getting out on the ribosome, small interfering RNAs that could disrupt the process, right? And then post-translational control is what? Folding and modifying, good. Okay, next. Did it stop? No, it's seizing It's still seizing on your side? Okay, so just trust me when I say that I have uh, slides that show all of that. Oh, I'm trying to just click on one and see if it'll let me. Then let's talk about mutations. There was frame shift and there was what? Point mutations. 
So point mutations, you could point to one nucleotide that was wrong. It does it is it always cause problems? No. You could have what kind of mutations? Silent mutations, right? You could have nonsense mutations, which cause what? A stop code on. You could have missense mutations that what? Yeah, you've got the wrong amino acid. It loses its functionality. If I was going to have to pick between mutations and they said point mutation or frame shift, and you're like, oh, I don't want to get sick. I'm going to go with point. Because when you do a frame shift, you're reading how you read the mRNA is all off from that point forward, right? And that's why it causes big problems. Yes, question? Part of it, but I'm not ever going to hold you to that. But yes. Okay, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So then let me go on to the next thing that I can think of in this presentation that I spent two hours on getting ready for you today, which you cannot see. But I will share it with you once it stops seizing. Um, let's talk about virus. We never had a quiz over Chapter 20, which was viruses and bacteria. Do you remember that? And so, like, key things you want to remember for sure out of that is the structure of a virus, which it always has what? A protein capsid, what else? And it has a nucleic acid. And that nucleic acid could be what? DNA or RNA, and it could be what? Double-stranded or single-stranded. Okay, it worked last time. Maybe it'll work this time. Double-stranded or single-stranded. It could also have what else? It could have enzymes that are packaged within it, right? Enzymes packaged within it. It may have on the outside, what might it have? A membranous envelope. Good. Perfect. A membranous envelope. Okay. And then when you, I told you at the time, and I'm going to tell you again, I would know how to diagram both the lytic and the lysogenic cycle. Do you hear me? I'm saying it again. Lytic and lysogenic cycle. Very Stop. It doesn't do any good to whine. Okay. Very simple diagrams, but you need to make sure that your very simple diagrams. I'm not looking for complexity. I'm looking to see that you convince me that you understand the difference between the two. You know the stages. You know what's going on during that stage. Any critical names that are there. So let's review it. Remember the mnemonic for the lytic cycle? What was the mnemonic? AP bio mystery. So what was the first step? Attachment and then penetration. So you could literally draw, draw an oval bacterium, right? And you could draw a little virus sitting on top of it, like with legs, if you want. Very easy diagram, right? Attachment. Then for penetration, your next diagram would be labeled penetration. And I need to see that the nucleic acid is leaving the virus and going into the host cell. Yes? Okay. And if you draw a bacterium for me, what should be the shape of the host cell chromosome? A circle. So I ought to be able to see the difference. And I would bring my colored pencils, or you can borrow some for me to help you so you emphasize exactly what you're doing. Right? Bring some colored pencils. Okay? So attachment, penetration, AP, what's next? I need to see a bunch of parts in there. So you, whatever is the outside structure of your virus, I see several of those inside your cell. Um, I see several copies of whatever color your nucleic acid is inside your cell. Just a little line of nucleic acid. You could make it double-stranded, easy to see. That would make sense, right? I need to see a bunch of parts. Then what comes after biosynthesis? Maturation. I need to see within the host cell chromosome a bunch of little viruses that look exactly like the single one that was outside. Yes? Maybe I see five or six of them in there. Okay. And then what happens? Release. Bust open your cell and show me viruses leaving. Okay. 
Now, that same diagram, I can attach onto it the lysogenic cycle. I just take a detour. I do attachment. I do what? Penetration. Then what do I do? I take one detour off and I do integration. And when I do my detour with my integration, I have to be able to show you that that color of nucleic acid that was in my virus is now part of that circular host chromosome, yes? And what do we call that? Not transgenic. If I did it as a person, yes, but it's naturally occurring. Prophage. I'm hearing it getting whispered over there. A prophage, right? Okay. So it is now a part, okay? It's a now part of the host cell chromosome. What would be really good to see is a little binary fission right there where you show me all the offspring of that bacteria have that same bad little virus incorporated into their host chromosome. Okay, that's our off ramp. Now we go back on. Where are we gonna go back on at? Biosynthesis, do I need to redraw that? No, I already drew it. It would be important in the AP bio mister circle that I see lytic cycle and in the off ramp, on ramp that's coming, I see what? Lysogenic. It is not a hard thing to do. And if you recall, the day we learned it, I told you to, to thank you, Nikki. I told you to practice right then. Do you remember that? Okay. Did it stop? Is it still seizing? Okay. Hair dog. Okay. Let's keep, do you want it, me to keep going in the few minutes we have left? Okay. So then we transition into bacteria. What did we learn new in back before we already learned all the structures in bacteria and what they do? The new thing that we learned was the three ways you can get variety besides mutation. What were the three ways? Okay, transformation, you pick up extraneous DNA from outside. Conjugation, you exchange DNA between two different bacteria using a sex pillus. What was the third way? Transduction, when a virus acts as a vector. Taking DNA from host one, not necessarily on purpose, it just picks up a little bit of its first host DNA and ends up giving it to its second host. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, and then speaking of viruses again, what were the different kinds of viruses that we had? Bacteriophage infects bacteria. We had animal viruses and then specifically retroviruses, remember that, who use reverse transcriptase to incorporate? Okay, and then I think we learned about um, emergent diseases. Do you remember that? Okay, so like bacteria and places when we change the climate, then they come out. Um, we also learned about gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative doesn't take a stain, but we also remember it's kind of negative because what do we have trouble with? Antibiotics have a harder time trying to get when we're trying to get rid of gram-negative bacteria. Okay, then the only other chapter we didn't have a quiz on was the one we just finished on biotechnology. And the, if you look through the key events, and I listed them for you in this Pear Deck, is they're all listed, like the chapters we didn't have a formal review on. I listed it for you. Things like recombinant DNA, right? The process of recombinant DNA with your restriction enzymes in your ligase, right? We talked about PCR, DNA photocopying. We talked about we talked about gel electrophoresis, where we can sort DNA according to its size. So we can get an RFLP, restriction fragment length polymorphism, right? Yes. Oh, I did do a review on this? What was the other chapter? Oh, sorry, 42. Sorry, my bad. Thank you, thank you. You can always tell me this stuff earlier. So 42 was on development, so let's talk about that. For development, it was the what and the how, right? Mm -hmm. And the what were the stages, which you know we have, right? Zygote, 
cleavage, right? Cleavage, cleavage, cleavage. We form a solid ball of cells called a marula. Then we pump in salt, who follows? And we form a blastula. That's a hollow ball of cells. Let out the gastrula. And we have a layered ball of cells. Remember ecto, meso, and endoderm and how we can determine what, what each of those will be, yes? And then we have the neurula, right? When the notochord induces the tissue above it, okay? That was the what. The how, we talked about the importance of differentiation where you actually become that thing. But before you become that thing, what do you get? Another D word. Determined, right? Determined. And that's where you are going to become that. You just haven't become that yet. Okay. And we talked about, remember the presumptive nervous tissue, like what would become the spinal cord? It won't become the spinal cord unless what's right below it. Yeah. The notochord is what determines it to be the spinal cord, right? And that's called induction. And you would use morphogens. And what it all boils down to is control of gene expression. And since they are eukaryotes, is it going to be negative control or positive control? So it's going to be all about the transcription factors, right? We had the whole long list. Well, we talked about differentiation. We talked about induction. And we talked about apoptosis, right? But And we already did a induction in the lens of the eye. We used that as an example. And death is a part of the development. But that complicated part at the end, that Evo Devo stuff, was basically saying that you have within the egg maternal determinants, right? Because when you do myo -my meiosis, you make one large egg and then little polar bodies. There are mRNAs already in the egg. And then remember the sperm, where the sperm hits the egg, that's going to be the anterior end, and the other one's going to be the posterior. Dorsal is no yolk, ventral is yolk. Remember that part? So we start out with these maternal determinants. Then we had the gap genes and the pair rule. You don't have to memorize gap or pair rule. It all came down to what was the most detailed of our Russian nesting dolls. Started with an H. Hox gene, the code for what? Transcription factors, right? Which sets you down your developmental pathway. Okay, and I will send you this, plus you have the reviews for the other. You got this. You're welcome.